During the 1920s, the Big Easy was home to some of the most notorious members of the New Orleans underworld, including Silvestro Silver Dollar Sam Carollo, a mafioso whose life is shrouded in legend and mystery. There's a lot of lack of reliable sources when it comes to Carollo. He's kind of a mysterious figure when it comes to who was he as a person. His name. You see it as Carolla and Carollo. And there's always been that argument, which is it? And I've heard different excuses of, of why somebody just heard it as Carolla and it got printed as Carolla and it got changed to Carolla at some point was because of the newspapers. Also, his nickname, Silver Dollar Sam. It appears that was an invention of the newspapers as well. As a member of Charles Matranga's Black Hand Gang, Sam Carollo quickly became a force to be reckoned with, eventually surpassing Matranga as New Orleans' top dog. If Carollo ever resembled an Al Capone figure in New Orleans, it was during this time. The newspapers would call him the little czar of the underworld, a viper's bootlegger, and the worst of the Chicago-style gangsters. But Sam Carollo's luck was about to run out when one of his targets survived an attack. Carollo and his gang beat up Hayes, and Carollo shot him in the back, and Penton survived, so he was able to identify Carollo as the shooter. This is Mafia. Silvestro Carolla was born June 17, 1896, in Terracini, Sicily. At the age of six, Carollo emigrated to the United States with his mother, arriving in the French Quarter of New Orleans. Ronald Rawson is a contributor to the National Crime Syndicate. Sam was six years old. Sam and his mother come over on the SS Manila in 1903. They leave the port of Palermo on January 24th, and they arrive in the port of New Orleans on February 14th, 1903. And it was just Sam and his mother, uh, Serafina Bomarita. There is no documentation of Sam's father, and it's believed that his mother, Serafina, raised Sam as a single parent. As Carollo grew into his teenage years, he began a romantic relationship with his first cousin, Katarina. So the first we hear of Sam in the newspapers is in 1913. Katerina was born in New Orleans. Her dad, Anthony Carollo, was Sam's uncle. Katerina goes by Tenny. Tenny and Sam disappear the first week of March in 1913. They go to a, a French Quarter hotel and they register as man and wife. And they're there for about a week until the, the operator of the hotel uh, reads in the newspaper that two 16-year-olds were being sought, you know, they had run away. From the description that she read in the newspaper, she figured, okay, that's the, the two kids that I, I have here. The hotel manager notified the authorities. When questioned about their marriage, Carollo lied and said he and Katarina eloped. You know, when, when they got busted at the hotel, you know, they were both taken, uh, Tenny was taken to a, a home for, I guess, basically wayward girls. And um, Sam was taken to like a juvenile detention center. And Tenny basically told the people and her father that she would rather die than live without Sam. Well, this didn't sit too well with Tenny's dad, Anthony. And, and after some discussion with the courts, they decide to let Sam and, and Tenny go to Gulfport because Louisiana had a law where you couldn't marry your first cousin, but Mississippi had no qualms about it. On March 20th, 1913, Sam Carollo and his first cousin, Katarina, traveled to Gulfport, Mississippi and became husband and wife. During this time period, the Matranga crime family had risen to prominence in New Orleans. Charles Matranga ruled over the New Orleans underworld with lucrative criminal activities, including extortion and labor racketeering. 
Sam Carollo had risen through the ranks of Matranga's Black Hand Gang, becoming an influential member. Shortly after Prohibition, Charles Matranga was unwilling to get involved in bootlegging and decided to retire. It is rumored that following Matranga's retirement in 1922, Corrado Giacona assumed leadership and Carollo handled day-to-day -day operations. Basically what you would call a street boss. This, this kind of fits all the little bits and pieces that you find on New Orleans mafia history. There's no real definitive book, uh, source or anything. There's all little bits and pieces scattered all over the place. You gotta kind of put them together. In 1927, Sam Carollo filed a petition for citizenship. He was ultimately denied due to his two-year stint in federal prison four years prior for stealing 89 barrels of beer, a violation of the Volstead Act, also known as the National Prohibition Act. Sam, you know, a, a lot of sources say Sam never became a citizen, never tried to become a citizen. Well, he did. February 27th, 1927, he filed a petition for naturalization, but he was rejected for naturalization due to his Volstead Act violation. So he, he tried to do the right thing and become a citizen. It just didn't work out the way he wanted. Legend has it, at the height of Carollo's power, infamous mafioso Al Capone tried to convince Carollo to supply his Chicago outfit with imported booze in exchange for cutting off rival bootlegger Joe Aiello. Al travels to New Orleans. Sam meets Al at the train station. One version has it with some goons, another version with some New Orleans cops. Al gets off the train with his goons and Sam basically tells him to turn around, go back to Chicago. However, Al being here in 1929, Al had a really busy year in 1929. You know, he had the uh, Valentine's Day massacre. He went to jail in, in Pennsylvania. And two, you know, Al was one of the most famous people in the country. You know, photographers followed him everywhere. You know, if, if Al had visited New Orleans, it, it seems like it would have been documented by the newspapers. As far as I'm concerned, it's myth. I mean, I never say never because you never know what kind of information might pop up later. This episode of Mafia is sponsored by CD Universe. Established in 1996, CD Universe is one of the Internet's leading retailers, specializing in the sale of domestic and imported music, movies, and adult products. That's right. CD Universe has a huge selection of novelties and adult toys from all the major brands, including Cal Exotics, Doc Johnson, Evolved, and Pipe Dream. Also, boutique brands, condoms, and even lingerie. At CD Universe, you can take your time and shop privately. Try whatever you want and get whatever you need. There's no judgment. Plus, shipping and billing are completely discreet. Not feeling kinky? CD Universe offers a vast selection of music, movie, and video game titles, with most ready to ship in one to two days. For listeners of Mafia, get 20% off your first order by visiting cduniverse.com forward slash mafia. That's cduniverse.com forward slash mafia for 20% off your first order. Thursday, August 22nd, 1929. Two alleged opium traffickers were being pursued by Agent Clarence Moore and Agent Julius Piper. That morning, the two suspects emerged from the shadows and got into their vehicle. Agent Moore slammed on the gas and rammed his car into theirs. As Agent Moore left his car to apprehend the dealers, one of the suspects shot Moore in the face. The bullet went straight through his jaw. Dexter Babin is the interim executive director and curator at the Regional Military Museum in Houma, Louisiana. New Orleans during the 1920s was named one of the largest dope distributors. And when we talk about dope here, we mean heroin. And 
In the summer of 1929, there was a heroin shortage in New Orleans, causing dope prices to skyrocket. He actually survived the shooting. But the, the shooting of Moore was an embarrassment to New Orleans. The Saturday of Moore's shooting, police superintendent Theodore Ray demanded a citywide cleanup of uh, New Orleans' $1 million a year dope industry. As police conducted raids throughout the area, witnesses identified Peter Capro and Armando Omari as the alleged suspects. Their bonds were set at $15,000 each. Capro was a bootlegger. He had a long history of violence and bootlegging, and Omari didn't fit kind of the profile. He was an ex-sailor, a drifter, and a drug addict. So they brought Capro into Moore's hospital room, but Moore didn't identify him as the man who shot him. Three weeks after the shooting, Moore would appear uh, at the New Orleans District Attorney's Office signing uh, a document saying that Peter Capro and Armando Amari were not the two men who shot him. So that kind of let him off the hook for that. It would be Agent Moore's partner, Agent Piper, who would file a blank complaint and identify Sam Carollo and Frank Todaro. Frank Todaro was a pretty important figure. He was underboss to Corrado Giancona, and he was also the uncle to Jacqueline Todaro, who ended up marrying Carlos Marcello. Carollo and Todaro had fled New Orleans shortly after Moore's shooting. Grand jury indictments were soon handed down for the two men. In late February 1930, police were notified that Carollo and Todara had returned and were immediately arrested. At the trial, Sam and Frank testify that they were in New York. The story was that they had given $5,000 to a man named Louis Schwett to finance a large whiskey shipment from Mexico. Schwett basically disappeared with the money and basically screwed Sam and, and Frank. They, they heard that he was in New York, so they decided to go to New York to find him and get their money back and extract whatever revenge they were going to. Their story was that they left and they arrived in New York. They drove up, arrived in New York on August 18th, 1929, four days before the shooting. During the trial, they produced receipts from the hotel along with a photocopy of the hotel register, showing that they registered on August 18th. Eventually, both men were released due to lack of evidence and cleared of all charges related to Moore's shooting. Fortunately for Carollo and Todaro, there was just not enough evidence to charge them with this crime, so neither of them served time in jail. September 1st, 1930, Hayes Penton and Hubert Serigent were at the home of John Seconelli, leader of a gang of bootleggers. Penton would later testify that he saw a truck full of whiskey being delivered to Zeccanelli's residence by Bill Bailey and Paul Duplessis. Hours later, Sam Carollo, along with associates Sammy Kansas City Sam Rubdo and John Mendona, make a surprise visit to Zeccanelli's house, demanding the return of his whiskey supply. Several nights prior, Carollo's stash had been raided by hijackers at the home of Vincent Rizzo, and several thousand dollars worth of liquor was stolen. Both Zeccanelli and Penton denied any knowledge of the hijacking. Carollo and his gang beat up Hayes, and Carollo shot him in the back, and Penton survived, so he was able to identify Carollo as the shooter. Carollo was arrested, but quickly posted bond. Months later, on December 29th, Hayes Penton, Bill Bailey, and John Zeccanelli congregated in front of Zeccanelli's home on Governor Nichols Street. The reason for the meeting was unclear, but possibly due to Zeccanelli's upcoming departure to Atlanta, where he was to serve one to three years for violating the Volstead Act. Around 10 p.m., all three parted ways. Bailey returned an hour later to Zeccanelli's home for another meeting with a bootlegger named Alfred Austin. While Bailey waited outside, a lone car crept up Governor Nichols Street in the dead of night. Bailey was then shot 14 times in the abdomen and right arm. And they, they blasted him with shotguns. He initially survived. He survived until Sunday morning. He was lucid most of the, most of the, the, the time he was still alive. And the cops asked him 
you know, hey, who shot you? And, I, and all he would say is, it was that Sam Corallo and his gang. Bailey would die soon after. Corallo was immediately arrested and claimed to have no knowledge of the shooting. He told authorities he was at home at the time of Bailey's assassination. Corolla would be held for murder without bond while the New Orleans district attorney investigated Bailey's death. Corolla was still in prison when his trial began for the attempted murder of Hayes Penton. During the trial, Corolla was labeled by lawyers as the little czar of the underworld, a viperous bootlegger, and the worst of the Chicago-style gangsters. January 24th, 1931. Carollo was sentenced to 8 to 15 years for the attempted murder of Hayes Penton, which was to begin following a three-year sentence for violating the Harris Narcotics Tax Act. So he was looking at a good 18 years in jail, and this may start to speak to some of Carollo's political connections, if he had any. Carollo was pardoned by Governor O.K. Allen in 1934. And Governor O.K. Allen was Huey Long's puppet governor. Huey Long couldn't serve another term. So Governor O.K. Allen was governor, but he basically did whatever Huey Long told him to do. Following his pardon from Governor O.K. Allen, Carollo would soon find himself facing a five-year sentence for yet another violation of the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act. The United States government would soon determine Carollo to be an undesirable alien. They're like, why is this guy here? This guy's not even a citizen. Can we, can we send him away now? And that's when they started deportation proceedings against him. IP Vanish is a virtual private network, VPN for short, that helps you safely browse the internet. What you do online is no one else's business but yours. IP Vanish allows you to remain anonymous and secure. You can use a VPN on your computer, tablet, phone, and even when you're streaming media. For listeners of Mafia, IP Vanish is offering an incredible 65% off. Just $3.49 for the first month, or $31.49 for the year. With IP Vanish, you'll get anonymous IP addresses, circumvent any online censorship, protection when using public Wi-Fi, and 24-7 support through email, chat, or by phone. Go to ipvanish.com forward slash mafia to claim your 65% savings. IP Vanish has plans starting at just $3.49 for the first month, or $31.49 a year. This is the time to sign up. With our discount and their current promotion, you can get a VPN for 65% off the usual price. IP Vanish is the best of the best. Rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot, and that's with more than 6,000 reviews. That's ipvanish.com forward slash mafia and start protecting yourself online. In 1934, Sam Carolla was released from prison after negotiating a deal to relocate infamous mobster Frank Costello's slot machines from New York to Louisiana. In return for a cut of the profits, Carolla got political protection for all of his Louisiana operations. Ronald Rawson is a contributor to the National Crime Syndicate. You know, the story goes that when Frank Costello was kicked out of New York by the Little Flower, uh, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, he kicked him out along with his slot machines. The story goes that Huey Long invited Frank Costello to bring his slot machines down to Louisiana. At the time, you know, Sam was basically running things you would think Sam would would have had to have been part of the negotiations for that. There's no record of it. It is possible. However, like I said, Sam was either in court or most of the time in the 30s, he was in jail. By 1938, Carrillo was sentenced for yet another narcotics charge at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Upon his release two years later, the government became aware of Carrillo's lack of citizenship 
and was scheduled to be deported back to Italy. And luckily for Corolla, World War II broke out not long after that, and they put a freeze on all deportations. In 1944, Corrado Giacona died and was succeeded by his underboss, Frank Todaro. But just six months later, Todaro died from complications related to throat cancer. Corolla was now in charge. Rumor has it that Corolla was poisoning Todaro to speed the process of his condition along. In 1945, Louisiana Congressman Jimmy Morrison introduced a bill that would have granted Corolla citizenship. However, reporter Drew Pearson got wind of the secret deal and publicly exposed this information. Dexter Babin is the interim executive director and curator at the Regional Military Museum in Homa, Louisiana. New Orleans papers found out about it and went kind of crazy, saying, oh, we have a representative trying to pardon a gangster. Morrison claimed he had no idea who Corolla was. He did it at the request of a friend who was a lawyer, C. Ray Grill. He said this was not uncommon for him to do, so he claims. And right before his deportation in 47, Corolla was arrested again uh, with being linked to a, a wire racing service with his son, Anthony Corolla, and New Orleans gambler and gangster Joseph Pareto. Sam Carollo was finally deported by the U.S. government in 1947. So they scheduled his deportation for April 14th, 1947, but Sam offered to pay his own way back to Italy, so the government gave him an extra two weeks because Sam basically saved them $450 on a plane ticket. So they gave him an extra two weeks. Sam is deported on April 30th, 1947, you know, that basically left uh, a leadership hole in, in, in the family. There was a meeting at the Black Diamond Club in New Orleans, which was a predominantly African-American nightclub. And some authors suggest that they met in this back room to throw local authorities off to this meeting. And kind of the higher echelon of the New Orleans mafia gathered and and would figure out who would replace Carollo. Despite Carollo's son, Anthony, being an option, Carlos Marcello would preside over organized crime in New Orleans. Anthony didn't seem to have much support. He didn't seem Anthony was really a popular guy in the family. And Carlos, by, by 1947, you know, he had, he had done really well placing Frank Costello slot machines on the West Bank by 1945 when Frank Costello had opened up the Beverly Country Club in Jefferson, Louisiana, which was basically the biggest, swankiest gambling joint in the area, uh, Carlos Marcello was given a 12% interest in that. So he, he, had, uh, he had been steadily rising in the ranks. Once he was deported, he was deported to Terracini, Sicily, where he was from, and he operated a cafe there, according to the Federal Bureau of Narcotics file on him. There's enough evidence to suggest that he got into narcotic smuggling. In April of 1950, Harry Anslinger, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics director, spoke about a narcotics conference that was attended by exiled mobsters like Carollo, who were deported from the United States. You had Francisco Three Fingers Coppola over there. You had Anthony Lopiparo over there. Tano Lococo over there and Sebastian Gallo were all mobsters that were involved in the narcotics trade who were not naturalized citizens that were deported from the United States. And they met at a, a restaurant called Caesar's Restaurant in Tijuana, Mexico. Carollo allegedly established a criminal enterprise with fellow exile Charles Lucky Luciano. And some stories go that he was working with Lucky Luciano on, on the narcotics routes. One version even has Sam going to Mexico as a sort of liaison between Lucky and Italy and his drug people in Mexico. If you want to smuggle something into the country, Corolla was the best guy to do it because he was able to smuggle himself back into the country multiple times uh, after his deportation. In 1950, Sam Carollo had illegally made his way back to New Orleans. 
In a story printed in the New Orleans Item, Carollo claimed to be visiting his sick wife. He was quoted as saying, uh, I had to come back to see my wife and family. Life wasn't worth living without them, and there's no place like the United States. It was terrible to be away. And when he was told he could be facing a two-year jail sentence and a, and a thousand dollar fine, he further replied, I knew there was a risk to coming back, but nothing matters if I can only stay here. Carollo was found in a quote-unquote luxurious hideaway in Slidell, Louisiana, which is just kind of north of New Orleans, on July 4th, 1950, with a partner of his from his Prohibition days, Kansas City Sam, who was also deported in 1938. Just as a little side note, one of Carollo's lawyers was Jack Washerman. He, he helped write immigration laws in the 1940s, and he, was all, he would also become more well-known later on for being Carlos Marcello's immigration lawyer. Carrillo was deported again and remained in Palermo, Sicily for the next 20 years. According to Life magazine, Sam Carrillo returned to New Orleans at the request of Carlos Marcello to intercede disputes within the crime family. One account suggests that the rivalry was between Carollo's son, Anthony, and Marcello's brother, Joe, over the succession of leadership. Anthony previously lost to Carlos when it was decided to place Marcello in charge following Carollo's deportation. His son, Anthony, and his daughter, Sarah, they flew back to escort their aging, ill health father back into the United States. The story goes they flew into Canada and then entered the United States through Detroit. It appears that Sam came in legally, but maybe under false pretenses. Upon his return to the United States, a federal grand jury began investigating Carollo's return. However, the case was put on hold indefinitely due to his failing health. The press discovered Carollo was at Toro Infirmary on February 21st, 1970, uh, and he suffered from a heart attack. And an investigation started on how he entered the United States, but he outlived the investigation. On June 26th, 1970, Silver Dollar Sam Carollo died at age 74. As I said in the beginning, the, the nickname of Silver Dollar Sam, you know, you don't see it until the articles in 1970, where, you know, first they're reporting that Sam is back in town and then the obituaries. And Silver Dollar Sam is on, I think, I think every one of those clippings that I've got. Uh, a story was told to me by one of the uh, Tadaro descendants, uh, his dad, when, when um, Sam came back into town, it was being reported all over the news that Silver Dollar Sam is back in town his dad, who was a Tadaro, uh, knew Sam, and he, he started yelling at the TV, apparently, is, what is this silver dollar Sam shit? That's Sam Carollo. So, uh, yeah, it, it seems it seems the silver dollar Sam was just uh, an invention of, of the papers. Years later, following the death of Carlos Marcello, Sam's son, Anthony, would finally become boss of the New Orleans crime family. Because he had always resented losing out he thought since his, his dad was Sam Carollo, he was his son, it was his right to take over. It never got into like a, a violent rivalry, but there was always that rivalry between Marcello faction and the Carollo faction. Anthony Carollo's time as the family's boss was short-lived. He was soon arrested and convicted in the hard crust sting by the FBI in the mid 1990s. He spent four years in prison for illegally scanning video poker machines. The legacy of Sam Carollo, much like the New Orleans crime family, is cloaked in mystery and folklore. New Orleans never had a rat. Uh, if you look at New York and even Chicago, there's all kinds of rats. There's all kinds of guys that flipped, uh, gave testimony. Even if you, you take some of that testimony with a grain of salt, like, you know, Henry Hill and stuff, or even Sammy Gravano, you know, I mean, they, 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 their testimony was self-serving for the most part. They did give some information that was corroborated, you know, through other sources. So, and, and especially New York, there was a lot of rats in New York. Is That's, you know, that's reason that information is much better and there's much more of it. You know, even the, the cops, they had their informants. 
all the cops that wrote books, you know, they, they had informants, even if they weren't named, they got information from their informants. To this day, we still don't have a firm grasp on the organization of the New Orleans Mafia. You know, if the rest of the families in New York and Chicago, I wouldn't even call New Orleans a family. But you have these organizational maps, these charts, where you have boss, underboss, capo, and soldier. We have none of that for New Orleans. The government was never able to figure out, besides that Carlos Marcello was the head of some kind of criminal syndicate, that who were members of it, what their rankings were, and what they did. That's a 90% of the reason why you had no one flip and testify against Marcello. FBI had no idea who to target, who to bug. They kind of didn't understand how this organization was structured. And that went on. The FBI has been complaining about that since the Kiava Committee in the 50s to the last FBI operation against Marcello, which was Camtext in the in the mid 80s. So you, you almost have like a 40 year period where we just don't know the structure of this organization. This episode of Mafia is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. They'll assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. BetterHelp allows you to log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. Personally, I appreciate the guidance and support I've received from my counselor. She provides a safe space for open communication and gives me sound advice. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash Mafia. That's better H-E-L-P. And join the over one million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Mafia listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com forward slash Mafia. Next week on Mafia. In the mid-1940s, a young man by the name of Jimmy Fratiano arrived in Los Angeles and quickly rose through the ranks of the L.A. crime family. In that culture, he was an admired personality, and they knew that Jimmy could carry out just about whatever deed needed to be done. And, of course, uh, he proved uh, over the years that he was quite capable of doing that. But as the landscape of the L.A. crime family changed, so did Fratiano's status. Disagreements with high-ranking members put his life in danger, leading to a life-changing decision for Fratiano. So it didn't take a genius to understand that something uh, was going on in Jimmy's life and his relationship with the L.A. family that was significant. This has been Mafia an Audio Boom original series, hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. This show is produced by Audio Boom's Lauren Vogel, Blair Payton, Pam Burroughs, Karen Bevan, and Rachel Jacobs. Executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Special thanks to Ronald Rawson and Dexter Babin. For more information regarding the New Orleans Mafia, visit nationalcrimesyndicate.com and louisianamafia.wordpress.com. Follow Mafia on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. <laughs>